Coti, my sister. Welcome to another feminine womanhood video. I know it's been a little while. Um, I've been putting a lot of focus into the new um, Great Deception series, but don't worry, I didn't forget about this womanhood series. Um, today we're going to be talking about homemaking and how it's part of our calling and our role as women. Um, specifically, what being a domestic queen is, how we can be more joyful in our role as being a homemaker, um, tips on being a better homemaker, and things like that. So um, definitely let me know if you'd like more videos as far as homemaking things. Um, I do have a cleaning routine video that I will link below. I have um, yeah, a cleaning routine that reply, a, um, goes with homemaking. And then I also think I'm going to try to link a video that I had from a while ago, which I per have previously put on private, but I think I'm going to put it back on public. Um, a video on the it's a book, The Magic of Tidying Up and, and Being Organized and Clean um, in Your Home. So I think I'm going to go ahead and make that one public again so that you guys can um, see that too and be able to get a deeper look into that. So let's first talk about being a domestic queen. So whether you're married, whether you're widowed, whether you're divorced, whether you're single, never planning on being married, whatever the case is, a single mom doesn't matter, we still as women are called to be homemakers and keepers of the home. So what is a domestic queen? So first, a domestic queen is a great, amazing homemaker home, homemaker or homekeeper. Um, she keeps a clean, orderly home, has well-behaved children who are respectful and obey <laughs> their elders and their parents. Um, they cook really awesome meals and it's pretty just overall successful in the home. This doesn't mean that you're perfect. This just means that you are successful in your role as being that homekeeper. Um, secondly, the term actually relates to the woman herself and her orientation towards her work. So she accepts her, her work. She considers it a sacred career, a sacred thing, a sacred part of her role. Um, it's a career of worldwide importance to her and has very in, um, very important purpose to it. And because she thinks of this role of homemaking in this way, she loves um, she loves doing it. She loves serving her family. She loves the role that she's been called to, but she also has a joy when she goes about it and they respect her in that role. Um, she's the queen of her household and she brings a sort of glory to her role as a homemaker. She serves faithfully as the understanding wife, a devoted mother, and a successful homemaker. She's skilled in the arts of or cooking, sewing, cleaning, organizing, managing a household, caring for her children, handling money wisely, interior decorating, and the list goes on. A lot of different, um, a lot of different jobs. So not only does she do these jobs, but she does them well. She goes beyond the call of duty. She goes the extra mile doing more than what's actually required of her. She's a good manager of time and values. She's not the most perfect housekeeper, again, in the world, or the best cook, or even the most devoted mother. But she does succeed overall in her whole responsibility of being the homekeeper or the homemaker. She's very successful in being able to um, list priorities and divide her time between her husband and her children in the home, um, putting an emphasis on where it counts at that moment in time. Um, now, again, she may, she's not perfect, but she could be the best in town. This, isn't de this definitely doesn't limit you as a homemaker. Um, you can definitely be the best in town, but it always depends on the situation. But the point of being a domestic queen is knowing how to balance it all and being able to be successful in it all. So being a domestic queen, meaning you add feminine touches to your homemaking, you know, you make your home feel cozy and warm for the people who live there. It's not, you know, harsh and cold. Um, you add feminine touches to your meals. You add things like pretty plates or, you know, just a nice setting, you know, not always giving food just out on paper plates and things like that. Um, and you cook good food. Again, did I mention good food? So there's a warmth of, of your spirit that is added to that household. Um, it reminds me of how, like, anytime you go to a home, if the, if the, if the mother isn't there, if the wife isn't there, you know, because ultimately 
which we learned um i forget which blog post it is but i'll try to link it below if i can remember which one it is on the website um, but we talk about how the woman is really the hub of the home and you don't realize that until the woman's gone and things just feel like they don't work and they don't flow as normal but beyond that you also kind of feel a sense of her her warm spirit isn't there and it's kind of like man you really wish mom was here there's nothing like mom's cooking you know so you have to realize that as women um, we are the hubs of our household whether you're a mother or whether you're a wife or whether you're single you know you still become the hub of your home and so we have to realize that that our spirit adds to the home and so we want to make sure we're adding that warm spirit to the home we want to make sure we bring joy to the home and we talked about this in the radiant happiness video that came before this um, where we talked about how to really be a beautiful woman right um, you're the, again this the hub of the home the central figure the tree of life the heart of the home you fill the home with understanding and with love and happiness you present light in the home you're cheerful you present warmth you you have this contentedness about you and you just really just radiate that to everyone in your home and of course this doesn't mean you're perfect this doesn't mean that um, 24 7 you're gonna be walking around with a smile on your face but it means for the most part, you are very successful in your role of doing all of these things, being a feminine woman and embracing that role. So this warm presence is what every man needs when he gets home from work. This is the same warm presence that every child needs when they get home from school. You know, they want to come home and feel welcomed. They want to come home and feel like this is their safe haven. They don't want to come home and feel like it's a battle and it's a war every time they come home or that they're neglected or that you know nobody really cares about them you want them to feel really awesome when they come home so the home again like i just said should be their refuge their source of comfort and understanding and love so a domestic queen we're still talking about all the qualities of a domestic queen she honors her position in the home she looks at her role in the home as being the most important in the world she creates a happy marriage and family life and raises honorable children and realizes that doing these things are making the greatest contributions to society because at the end of the day society is made up of people um, yes it's really awesome that we have amazing people who invent things and find cures for different diseases and help heal people and save people but all of those people who do those things came from a family and so you have to realize the importance that the role of the mother really truly does play. Um, so even though even though she does nothing more than living her daily life, if she does it well, it's of immeasurable value. No success compares to the success in the home. No failure, a worse failure. She's happy in her homemaking role. She's not bored. She doesn't complain about it. She's not looking to the world of men for fulfillment. So she's not looking out into the world like, I have to do what this man what this man does. I have to be president. I'm not saying that I'm not going to get into that topic. Let's just not even go there. But you know, you you're not looking into the world and saying I should do these things because my role at home, you know, isn't as important. That's basically what I'm trying to say here. She's not looking to the outside world for fulfillment. You know, she realizes that she's completely fulfilled doing what Yah has called her to do. Her glory is the esteem of her husband, the happiness of her children, and her overall success in the home. She may serve humanity in additional ways outside of the home, meaning hobbies or a career as far as a job or um, owning a business. There's definitely things that she does outside of the role of being a homemaker and stay-at-home wife or whatever the case is, but she realizes that she's not dependent upon them to be fulfilled in life. So, and to summarize the qualities of a domestic queen, which is one thing we should all aspire to be as women, uh, she does her job well beyond the call of duty. She's a good manager of time and values. She adds feminine, feminine touches to her homemaking skills. She adds warmth to her house. She honors her role in the home. She's happy in her role, completely fulfilled. Um, and I think that's all of them that I wanted to list. An essential quality of the domestic queen, though, is her ability to find joy and satisfaction in her work. So now we're going to talk about, okay, now we know the qualities of being a really awesome homemaker, but one of the most essential qualities that we pointed out is having that joy 
of being a homemaker, a homekeeper. And so now we're going to kind of shift gears and we're going to talk about how you can become a joyous homemaker. So the satisfaction or the joy um, comes as a result of your attitude about your work, your control of your life, and your diligence in performing your work. So tip number one on how to be a happy homemaker. So number one, accept drudgery. So realize that not every aspect of being a homemaker is going to be fun or exciting. It's not going to always feel pleasant. Some people really, really hate cleaning toilets. But at the end of the day, we all love the results of having a clean toilet and a clean bathroom. You know, um, not every mother loves cleaning up puke, you know, when their kid throws up. But you realize that you get a joyous result out of it, right? So accept your work in the home as part pleasant and part unpleasant. Some jobs are not joyous, at least not for you. And every woman's different. Some women love cleaning toilets. Some women don't mind cleaning up puke, while some women hate it. You know, every woman's different. But you have to look at it this way. Even if you were to get a job outside of the house, there's still going to be aspects of the job that you're going to hate. For me, example, I worked in a call center and I absolutely hated taking phone calls. I hated it, but I loved responding to the emails. And so there's aspects of that job that ultimately I hated, but I was grateful for the role that I was able to play because I was able to, at the end of the day, help people and help to brighten their day a little bit and make them feel better, especially when orders were going completely wrong and they needed it for a special event and things like that. We, we were able as people in the, as representatives of the company, we were able to take people not just down from being angry to realizing that there was a solution that we could go about solving the issue, and et cetera, et cetera. So a certain amount of your work is going to be drudgery. A certain amount of it's not going to be fun. Many of our duties are a source of real joy. You have caring for children. You have cooking really yummy food. You have cleaning the house. All of these things can be pleasant experiences. Some women actually delight in doing these things. Little of our work, if you really truly think about it, is truly unpleasant. But when it does seem like it is to you, you have to face it honestly and say, look, this isn't fun for me. I don't enjoy cleaning the toilet, but you know what? I love the feeling of sitting on a clean toilet or I love the feeling of being able to take a shower in a clean bathtub or even like saying, oh, well, I just cleaned the tub. Man, now I can take a nice bath. You know, being able to to see the end result and say, you know what, I may not like this action now, but it's going to get me to an end goal and realizing that you're not going to love everything about homemaking. Nobody in any job loves every aspect about their job. So. Tip number two, don't get crowded for time. Don't become overbooked and do a million things and then not have enough time to do them because then you won't do them greatly, right? So if you really truly want to enjoy homemaking, don't become too busy, don't become too involved in too many activities outside of the home. So the most time consuming um, activities are outside having an outside job, um, assisting your husband in his business, or doing masculine jobs around the house like yard work or painting or handling money, etc. Um, other things that are time consuming can be clubs, um, class education classes, lessons, um, even things within the home can be time consuming. Things like social media, watching TV, um, reading magazines, you know, there's a lot of time consuming things that we as women, being homemakers, especially if you're a stay at home, wife or mom you definitely realize can be time consumers so when anything crowds you for your time you end up hurrying through all the tasks that you have to get them over with and so you don't enjoy them and a lot of times you don't end up with a very good result either because you were in a rush i don't know if you've ever been in a rush like for me there's been times when i'm in a rush especially with shabbat um but i'll be in a, in a rush to clean and i'll notice that i do a really half-assed job because I was in a rush because I didn't give myself enough time because that day I decided to overbook myself and like say there was that week where I put out like three videos on a Friday and then two I had recorded five that whole day and I had two coming scheduled for, for Saturday and I got comments like oh well you were talking too fast and things like that 
And that to me, looking back, was a, um, a complete result of me overbooking myself. Because not only had I planned to film five videos, I actually had planned to film six, um, but I had also planned to clean my house in prepare preparation for Shabbat. And I had planned to go to the grocery store and get food for Shabbat and do things, all of these things. And so since then, of course, I've learned my hugest lesson was Shanae, don't overbook yourself. You have seven days or six days, really, because six days you should work, one day you should rest. So you have six days to get all of these tasks done. Break your videos down into two a day or one a day or know that, you know, Fridays, break your break your cleaning tasks on Thursday and Friday instead of just Friday. So now Thursdays I do my laundry and I do my vacuuming of the house and my dusting and things like that and sweeping. But then Friday I'll go and I'll clean the bathroom and I'll make sure the dishes are clean and well I wash dishes every day. But I'll clean the kitchen, I'll water my plants outside and clean off my patio, different things like that. And then I know that, okay, I have at least one video plan for Fridays, but if I can get to two, then I will. I also have made a rule for me that I only create videos between the time of 8 and 2 p.m. So that gives me time in the morning, one, to kind of get myself together, figure out what my day is going to look like, uh, give myself time to listen to the word or to pray or to whatever it is that I want to do to have that me time. I do my work from 8 to 2 and a lot of that work is me um, diving into research, taking notes, putting presentations together, putting videos together, filming them, up editing them, uploading them, posting within the Facebook group, talking to the, to, to the ladies in the group and really kind of trying to develop those friendships and really have discussions. And I do all of that between 8 and 2 o'clock. But then once 2 o'clock hits, it's time to shut down and I, you know, go and I make sure the house is picked up before my husband comes home. And I make sure that I'm getting ready to cook dinner because I know he always comes home at a certain time and he comes home ready to eat. So, you know, that's me learning, okay, I can't overbook myself. I have to give myself enough time to be able to do whatever activities I need to do so that I can get them done, get them done in a timely manner, get them done correctly, and have a joyous result. So just something that I wanted to personally point out from my own experience of being a stay-at-home wife. Um, so let me see. Third thing would be to go the second mile. So to do, go beyond the care of duty. Go beyond what you're expected to do. Um, so going the second mile or going beyond the call of duty lifts the burden from work and makes it seem easy or enjoyable. Many of us fail to find happiness in homemaking because we only go the first mile. We only give the bare minimum just enough to get by. We feed and clothe the family and keep the house reasonably clean, but not an ounce more. Meals are quick and easy so that we can do what we want. And this doesn't mean that we can't have quick and easy meals. I'm talking more like you're going to throw something in the microwave and feed it to your kid because you'd rather do that and say at least they're fed than take the time to actually go the extra mile and cook them a nice dinner. Um, if you give just enough, you'll never enjoy homemaking. You have to go the second mile to enjoy anything. And I have found that to be true in my life as well, whether it comes to um, homemaking, exercise, even my work in my YouTube videos. I find that when I give the bare minimum and I'm like, at least I got the presentation up, like I didn't enjoy any aspect of actually getting the video together. And I can tell that people can feel that spirit because I'll notice those are my least viewed videos. Um, and then so the videos where I know that I put a lot of energy and time into, like especially now lately, um, I've put a lot of energy and time into creating an intro. Um, although it's the same intro now every time, I took time to create the images that were needed. I took time to pick music that would flow. I took time to, you know, decide my presentations were going to have a floral background instead of having that black background to make them more feminine. And so doing all of that has actually made it more joyous for me to edit a video and to save it and render it and upload it and then write the descriptions and things like that. It's made me more excited to do that because I'm going the extra mile. So just, again, experiences that I've personally had. Um, another tip would be to get rid of selfishness. So realize that, yes, taking care of yourself is important, but when you become obsessed and become self-centered and really too focused on self-love, you become selfish. So when you begin to obsess over things that you lack in life or you begin to think that there's an unending need for you to have me time all the time, you become selfish. 
And when you're selfish, you lose that sense of joy. You're no longer thinking about anybody else. You're no longer caring about anybody else. You're no longer seeing, seeing the positive in the task that you're doing. You'll just be sitting there like, well, I really don't want to wash dishes right now. I shouldn't have to wash dishes right now. I need some me time. So I, I, I'm angry that I have to wash dishes. Or you can approach it and say, you know, I'm washing dishes to get to the end result of my kitchen being clean and my kitchen looking nice because I personally love walking into the kitchen and seeing no dishes in my sink or I personally love walking into my bedroom at night and seeing the bed is made you know I love being able to come to my couch after working at the computer all day and seeing the couch is clean you know and that there's just the pillows on it and it's welcoming and comforting you know so there's definitely you know a difference when you're not being selfish and when you're not self-centered to when you become family centered and you become yeah centered and things like that so to get rid of being selfish focus on your husband focus on your children and focus on meeting their needs and excelling that make overcoming selfishness a matter of conversation with yah as well make sure you pray and you ask yah to help you to master selfishness and not to be selfish to be humble you know that's something that yah is also going to have to work on your heart and you know as you change and as you grow in his torah so rejecting greed so don't buy into the idea that you have to have everything in the world or that you have to live a certain lifestyle your kitchen has to look just like this magazine or just like this pinterest photo to be happy because this at the end of the day is going to rob you of joy it's going to cause you to be greedy and to constantly want more and more and more and more you have to realize that at the end of the day you have to have just the basics of life food, water, shelter, right? And anything above that is considered a luxury. And you have to realize that adding more luxuries on top of more luxuries, you honestly end up wanting more and more. It's like the example of people who, you know, go and get extra jobs because they want to purchase something and then they, they get comfortable being able to afford certain luxuries. And then they find, you know, that they can't quit these other extra jobs because they've gotten themselves to a level of, I have to have this luxury. But it really comes from a sense of greed and a sense of pride, really, that you have to have these things. And it's not saying that you can't have these things. It's not saying you can't have a beautiful home and that you can't have a really nice car. But it's not making those things the center of your life. And it's about not making those things the things that will make you happy and fulfilled in life. At the end of the day, that's just materialism and those things you can't take with you anyway once you die. So... That's another one. And then the last tip I would say for being a happy homemaker would be to seek wisdom. And this is because being a wife and being a mother, um, either or or both, is a challenging feat in life. It's challenging learning how to love and accept people and how to care for people and how to deal with people. That is the most difficult task that any of us have to do with our, with our life. And so you have to constantly be seeking wisdom. And that's mainly going to be found in Yah's word and his Torah. His Torah really lays out tons of wisdom. I mean, the book of Proverbs alone, hello, is full of wisdom, right? So you want to make sure you're constantly seeking Yah's truth and wisdom when it comes to loving people and reflecting Torah to other people's lives. But don't be afraid to also learn about wisdom from other people. We have mentors and things and teachers that come along that are Yah ordained and filled with the Holy Spirit, you know, who can truly teach you the true wisdom of Yah. You know, he's definitely had multiple people who were mentors and teachers. All people throughout the Bible had mentors and teachers who taught them. So there's nothing wrong with teachers, again, but it's just having that discerning spirit of knowing what information to take and what information to let go and who to listen to and who not to listen to. So that's something that I say, you know, pray on and anytime you come across information, because there's a lot of homemaking information out there that teaches you how to be a better homemaker, how to create schedules and things like that. There's nothing wrong. That's still wise advice. That's still wisdom, you know. So seeking wisdom outside of the Bible, there's nothing wrong with that. It's about how you go about it. That's what I want to say on that. So now let's just talk about the fundamentals of homemaking and then we'll go ahead and kind of start wrapping this video up. So the difference between a good homemaker and a poor homemaker is a matter of following the correct fundamentals or principles. So number one would be concentration. So management of a household requires you to focus or to concentrate. You can't sit there and daydream all day. You can't ponder about problems and at the same time get work done efficiently. 
things like ironing and washing dishes and cleaning yes you can kind of daydream i daydream while washing dishes all the time my husband actually took a picture of me because he thought it was so funny because i was like staring off at the wall daydreaming while i was washing dishes and yes that's a time when it's perfect to daydream and to ponder on things because that's um a task that doesn't require a lot of concentration because you're just washing dishes right um but other tasks that do ooh, totally like missed my my thing there um other tasks do need your focus in order for you to get them done something like me doing presentations and making sure they don't have a bunch of typos in them you know all of those things so you have to be able to discern what needs your focus and what doesn't and be able to really put your concentration on the things that do um, second, simplify. You can't become a good housekeeper if you have too many things in your house, aka clutter. And this is where the book, The Magic, let me grab it really quick in case you haven't seen it. This book by Marie Kondo, The Magic of Tidying Up. This book really changed my life as far as how to get my ish together and make my home um, easy to clean, but also just beautiful to be in and something that truly brought both my husband and I joy so when you have a lot of things in the home it makes housekeeping difficult because then especially when you're cleaning you got to dust and clean around all of those different things right so to make things more efficient have only enough to serve the family and this is completely separate from the information when it comes to prepping and preparing your family for things to come. There's nothing wrong with storing food and water and things like that for emergencies. That's a whole different situation. But to have like 10 different irons or, um, you know, 30 different pots and pans in your house is extra. You really, truly don't need that many pots and pans, especially if you only have four aisles on your, on your stove, right? And I think the max I've seen on a stove is like maybe five or six. So do you truly need 30 pots and pans? You know, do you really need 100 forks? Probably not. Do you really need 50, 60 cups? Probably not. You know, like my husband and I, we have four plates, four bowls, four knives, four spoons, four forks, you know, two sets of chopsticks so that we can reuse chopsticks if we want to eat Chinese food or sushi or something like that. You know, we have a very limited amount of dishes when it comes to um, that. And that's just because it's just two of us. And even when we have family come over, we always have more than enough dishes for when family comes over because it ends up maybe being five or six people and we can make do with what we have. So it's really just about having enough and not needing to have an extra amount. And this comes with just ordinary things in life, not prepping material. Just want to point that out. So anything more clutters the household and can burden you as the housekeeper, the homekeeper, the homemaker. If you have a cluttered home and want to become more organized again, this is the book I would definitely recommend, um, Life Changing Magic of Tidying Up. And I will link my video below. I believe it's from last year and it was a vlog style video where I actually went through and decluttered everything that I had currently owned at that time. Um, and at the time I was living, we were my husband and I were living with my parents, so we didn't have too, too much stuff, but we had really kind of crowded the room we were living in with tons of stuff that we realized we didn't need. And I can truly look back and say now, like even looking at my home, it's very spacious. It's not very crowded. I think the most thing that we've ever collected is books, and the books even that we have are books that we constantly go through and if we don't want anymore don't want something we'll take them to the half price bookstore and you know let them sell them to somebody else who does want them um same thing with clothes we don't keep a ton of clothes especially if we're not wearing them um, when we do go shopping which is maybe like every three months or so we get things that we genuinely like and love and um, that we wear constantly i literally wear my clothes till they have no shape till they don't look good anymore and then i get a new pair some new clothes um, so anyways, I'm, I'll link that video below to kind of share what I went through with cleaning out things um, according to the magic of tidying up and just so you can get an overall idea of how she goes about cleaning. So in simplifying your home, everything should either be useful, beautiful, or both. And this is also something that you'll find in this book as well. So again, when it comes to my home, everything that we have is either useful or beautiful or both. And a lot of times if something's just useful and we come across something that's beautiful, that's both beautiful and useful, that can replace that item, we'll replace that item, we'll purchase it and we'll get rid of the old item. Um, and again, that's just about the home really bringing joy to us 
and it being a place where we can be comfortable and relax and be a, a place of refuge. I can truly honestly tell you that both my husband and I love being home. And that's because, you know, as a homemaker, I was truly excited and happy that I was able to create a place that felt really comfortable and just really awesome for my husband so much so that he loves coming home and he loves being home like yes we get out and we have fun but at the end of the day we love being home which is really awesome um so again more is not better unless it comes to prepping that's a whole different topic so number three would be to organize your things so now you've decluttered but now you need to make sure you're organized everything needs to have a place and everything needs to go back into that place when it's done being used so that everybody in the house knows where everything is. Perfect example for me would be my husband saying, well, like with the iPad, where's the Apple pen? Where's the Apple pen? And I'm always like, babe, it is in the same spot it's always in. And he'll be like, no, it's not. And then he'll go over there and he'll see, oh, yeah, it is. It's right there with all the dry erase markers in the office where it always is. Or we always know we keep all the iPad, Apple cords, um, chargers, any chargers we have, we keep them all in a bowl on top of the bookshelf. So we always know where the chargers are going to be. Or just like we always know where within the file cabinet different forms are. Um, we always know where all the books are because they're always on the bookshelf. We always know where everything in the house is because we always put everything back at the end of the day. You know, we don't just leave things, we don't just take things and put them in random places um, because then you'll find that we get frustrated because I'll be like, well, babe, where's this? I don't know. I don't know where I put it. Or he'll be like, babe, where's that? I don't know, babe. I don't know where I last put it. I took it out and I forgot where I put it, you know, because then we'll be stressing out trying to figure out where it is and trying to go get it. So everything needs to have a place and everything needs to be put back in its place when it's done and this is really something awesome to teach your children um, because then they'll grow up and they'll be more organized themselves and this doesn't mean they'll be perfect and this doesn't mean you'll punish them if they you know don't put something back but it means you begin to instill these qualities within them especially um, your, your, your daughters because they themselves will be taking on the role of being a homemaker so number four organize your work and your commitments so list all of your work and commitments that you do routinely. So things like your meals, your laundry, your cleaning, classes, lessons, errands, arrange them into a schedule. And this is when I say that you can go outside of the word to find things like there are tons of blogs and websites that go into making a schedule for homemaking. I'm not somebody, I don't think I'll create any videos on that, not yet at least, because I don't have children. Um, and so I feel as though women who really have a lot of kids to take care of or even one kid to take care of, you know, need to have a, a, a specific way of scheduling. For me, because it's just me and my husband right now, um, it's very easy for me to kind of schedule things and to know what's going on. I have a calendar on the wall where I put everything that's going to be going on um, and we put our budget on that calendar as well so we both always know what's going on. So that's kind of my way of having a schedule. But there's tons of websites. You can go on Pinterest and type in homemaking and you'll get tons of Pinterest boards, pins, websites, people who go really deep into homemaking. So I definitely suggest you check those um, those things out. But so once you do that and you create a schedule, you need to figure out the things that you just do occasionally. So social gatherings, lunches, appointments, dates, vacations. You need to make sure that you, you also put those into your schedule so that you, again, don't overbook yourself. And to be well organized and getting your work done, you need to use a planner of some sort. And the more busyness that you have, the more of a need you have for a planner. Now for me, personally, I have my YouTube plan because again, that's most of my work for the day from 8 to 2. I have a plan of every day I'm going to put out what videos am I going to put out. And I highlight them in different colors as I get through each task that's necessary. Um, but for the most part, because again, it's just my husband and I, we don't have too much busyness going on. Um, and so I don't at this point need a planner per se, um, because I have, you know, my, my task already decided, okay, Thursday's this day, Friday's this day. But as life gets more complicated, I would then need to go out and get a planner. So it really depends on your situation and lifestyle. Number five, organize your priorities. So work out all of your priorities. Put first things first. Um, list your most important duties and arrange them in order of importance. 
Make sure you consult your husband and your family on this as well. So especially your husband in deciding what should be a priority for you. Um, create a secondary list of things like your typical chores and make a third list again for occasional jobs. It's very important that you organize your priorities um, because when you do organize and keep your priorities, you end up avoiding time wasters. So things like getting caught on the phone gossiping for hours, watching you know the melodrama TV shows that come on at 2 o'clock in the afternoon or taking super long naps or getting sucked in on social media and Facebook and YouTube and Instagram and Snapchat and all the different social medias they have out there. Um, even going out to lunches and being out at lunches and schmoozing around and shopping for hours when you know you could have gotten some of your priorities done. Um, prioritizing things definitely puts you in a different mindset. You may justify the time that you spend on these time wasters by saying that, well, it's the me time, I needed some downtime, and yes, yeah, sometimes it is justified. There are days, like there was a day this week where I felt like I was going through a detox flu because I've been going through a, a detoxing period where I've been cutting out processed foods and things. And my body, I was literally in pain. Like my body was sore from head to toe. All my muscles ached really bad. I had a fever. Um, and so that day, thankfully, the day before, YouTube was playing me and I was only able to get one video out of the three that I had filmed and edited. I had them all done, I had only got one uploaded. And so I saved the two for the next day, not knowing that the next day I would have needed it because I wasn't able to film anything because I felt so crappy. So I was able to get those two videos uploaded, but I understood that I was justified that day in spending the day taking some notes and then the rest of the day I literally spent sleeping and just relaxing. And literally the next day I woke up and it was gone. I was like immediately just better. And so um, there are times when it's definitely justified to just have a time wasting day, especially if it's a day when you're sick and you need to just rest and relax. Um, but it's not something you're supposed to be doing every day. So again, that's where priorities come in. Number six would be working. So although you concentrate, simplify, organize and have priorities, you're not going to have success unless you actually take action and put in the work. You can do all this planning in the world, but if you don't take action, you don't get anywhere, right? So good homemaking requires diligent effort, as does any worthy achievement. The only way to run a household is to put on your apron, roll up your sleeves, and get to work. Number seven, make your man comfortable. This is a huge fundamental. So remember that your man's home is his castle. Make sure it's a comfortable place for him. Let him hang his coat on his chair. Let him leave his shoes at the door. Let him lay on the bed without changing his clothes or, you know, not worrying about messing up the bed. You know, let him come home and be able to relax. Don't nag him and say, well, you know, because this is something I catch myself doing sometimes. I'd be like, babe, why you got to leave your shoes right there? Or I'll be like, babe, why you just leave your bag right? Why why are you making the front the front door your closet? That's something that I say to him a lot, right? And it's me realizing that I'm not letting him be a sloth at home because he does end up getting up um, after he's sat down and relaxed after a long day at work, dealing with people, you know, making the money, being the provider, running his role. He wants to be able to come home and chill. You know, and that's something I had to learn too. Like don't bombard him with questions when he comes home. Don't bombard him with, you know, all of these topics of conversation. Let him come home. Let him sit down. Let him look at Facebook, you know, and watch funny videos. Let him relax and breathe. Bring him his meal. Let him eat dinner. Once he's relaxed, my husband, I know for sure, genuinely does get up and put his stuff away. Um, and for the most part, my husband's not very messy either in, uh, in any way. So... Um, but either way for me, it's me learning how to allow him to be comfortable when he comes home. Um, your children, on the other hand, are not your husband. So your children do need to be trained and instructed on to come home and put their things away. And that's because they're your children and they're not your husband. Your children should not be treated like your husband because your children are not the king of the house. Um, that's just another hint. So quickly, I want to touch on motherhood. Um, I'm not going to go too deep into this because I myself am not a mother. So these are kind of just lessons that I've learned that I will apply if Yah does bless me with children at some point in time. Um, but these are things that I came across that I was like, you know, these are really, really good tips. 
So, the domestic queen finds joy in bearing children if she's able to. Um, this is a natural instinct, instinct in the truly feminine woman, which is totally, totally true because I definitely get baby fever a lot. Um, this isn't something that you don't have to teach a woman again. It's something that we're born with. So you have to think of like Rachel and Hannah in the Bible who were barren at a time and cried out to Yah for him to bless them and to open their wombs and allow them to have children. This is something naturally that we, we as women want most of the time, I would say maybe 95% of women. Um, but again, with the feminist movement and stuff, women have been taught to kind of suppress that feeling. And a lot of women now actually suppress it so much that they say they don't want children at all. They don't want to be a mother. They don't have any inclination. Um, but it's like if you were, but when they get around babies and when they start seeing all these people having babies, those women secretly have a lot of baby fever and don't want to admit it. Um, so the feminine woman has a natural instinct to care for her children. She's consumed in feeding her children and guarding her home like an eagle. This is something we talked about um, in the womanhood section of the, the blog post. So I definitely suggest you check that out because we talked about what it meant to be a virtuous woman and that it meant literally like being an eagle and being really protective of your kids and of your family. Um, so I'll try to link that section below. She makes sure that they're clean, fed, and free of danger. She's gentle, she's loving, she's understanding. She teaches them how to be happy. She gives them praise and encouragement, feeding them not just physically, but spiritually. And this is something that we saw with the Proverbs 31 woman as well. Um, so how does a man view all of this? A man respects a woman who delights in bearing children. Let's just be real. A man's total view on a woman changes when he sees her go through childbirth and has he sees her go through pregnancy and having a kid. He has so much more respect for her as a woman, seeing everything that she she goes through for these children. Um, so the man himself may actually complain about the responsibility. He may seem um, unemotional towards it or, you know, indifferent towards children. He may even oppose the birth of even more children. He may say, I don't want you to have any more kids. But he doesn't admire the woman who complains. So it's kind of like that double standard there. But we have to acknowledge why. So he admires the woman who wants children and devotes themselves to, to their care, no matter what the sacrifice. Um, whoa, why am I? So we have to realize that although he may complain about these things, at the end of the day, he truly does enjoy children. And he, what he enjoys most more than that um, is seeing the woman delight in the children and so while again he may complain and may act like he doesn't want children when he sees you having children his mindset changes and when he sees the way that you delight in your children his mindset towards you changes and he becomes way more respectful of your role and your position and he begins to see you differently um, and again yes these are this is not the case in every single man but again we have to realize was that person a man or was he still a boy because there's a lot of men in this world who are not really men they're still children because they weren't truly raised on how to be a man so they don't even know how to step into that role um, so again a man does admire a woman who wants children and devotes herself to the care of her children no matter what the sacrifice so lastly i think this is lastly let's see okay so two more topics and we'll be done we're going to talk about meal prep real quick literally really quick and then we're going to talk about the overall character when it comes to being a homemaker and then we're going to close and this is going to be a super long video but i didn't want to cut this video into chunks just because homemaking is just a very simple topic i wanted to cover it all in one shot so Let's talk about meal prepping really quickly. Meals are important to our households. They're important to our children, um, especially when they come home. Again, I mentioned my husband loves to come home and be able to eat something. He always comes home hungry. Um, and so they wanna be able to come home and expect a good meal when they get here. And so this sets a really awesome atmosphere in the home. Can you just imagine? You're at work all day and you come home and the house smells amazing because your wife is in the kitchen cooking a meal and you're ready to eat, you've got your mouth salivating as soon as you walk in the door. You know, it's a really awesome atmosphere to walk into. Um, so, this doesn't mean you have to have an elaborate spread. You don't have to have a Thanksgiving dinner every time you make a meal. But this does mean that the meals are on time, they're delicious, and they're nutritious. So, of all the domestic tasks, other than taking care of your children, the most important is feeding the family because they have to actually survive, right? Um, other things can wait. 
Meals are daily needed, they're in demand. So to succeed in being a homemaker and preparing your meals, allow yourself enough time. So this again goes with overbooking yourself. Allow yourself to have the time to prepare it. Don't skimp by preparing something last minute in a rush. Set a time to begin preparing the meal. So a lot of us try to say, oh, well, I'll have dinner ready by five. But if you really say, okay, well, I'm going to start preparing my meal at three, you know, then you're not going to overbook yourself. Because you could be somebody who would be like, oh, it'll only take me 30 minutes and then it takes you an hour and then the dinner is late. But if you say, okay, I know it's going to take me this much time, I'm going to start at three. You know what I'm saying? So, um, also be sure to have a nice table setting if possible. And this is something that, like, for me, I don't use plastic or, uh, or plastic or, well, not plastic, but I don't use paper plates. I use um, glass plates. And if you have children, I understand if you want to get plastic plates. But you also have to understand that there are really beautiful um, plastic plates that are not going to break if your child drops the plate or bowl. Um, and so, you know, you can get really nice plates and things like that that aren't going to be breakable without having to get pl um, paper plates. Plus, you, you help save the world a little bit by not cutting down all those trees and all those things. So one thing that I really pride myself on is having um, very nice, simple white plates and white bowls. Um, I made sure that I bought forks and knives and spoons that my husband fell in love with um, at a store called World Market. And I literally, um, I had to buy each of them separately. And I was, it was worth the money to me because we love them and they're like really nice, heavy handed, um, heavy metal and like thick utensils. So that's something in and I always serve it with you know, I always serve him with a napkin, and my, my thing I love is using a cloth napkin. So I will, when I typically serve him a meal, I'll bring him his meal, and it'll, you know, depending on if it's a soup or not, it'll be on a glass bowl or plate with his utensil in it, and I will bring it to him with his napkin, and I'll ask him if he wants something to drink, and we have glass cups that we drink out of, um, and he has his favorite cups of all the cups that I've bought, you know, that he'll use, and I'll give him, you know, that cup. Um... And then I always ask him if he wants any condiments and things like that, depending on what we're eating. You know, but if I make him a burger, I already know how he likes his burgers. So I'll make sure that I put all his ketchup and mustard and everything on there and I'll serve it to him. He literally doesn't have to lift a finger. I will cook the meal, I'll prepare the meal, I'll clean the dishes after. You know, I do everything when it comes to that. And it's truly a moment for him to just be able to enjoy himself and to relax. And like... I absolutely love it and it's simple and we don't always eat at the table sometimes we eat right here on this couch and we'll watch a movie together um, but either way it's a nice setting for him so determine what it is that your husband likes and serve him in that way and then also just making sure that it's you know if you do have a big family and you all need to sit at a table sit at the table and enjoy dinner together um, so when it comes to preparing meals a lot of us women do feel in this area. I will admit I'm not perfect at all. I mean, yes, I have my days when I'm like so on point, but then I also have my days when I fail. Um, so a lot of times we go for super quick, easy meals um, with a big emphasis on the speed of things. Our goal is to get out of the kitchen in as short of a time as possible, using the fewest dishes and making the least mess. We rely on frozen dinners, packaged foods, canned foods, and quick foods. And fast foods if you um, count people going to drive throughs constantly and even worse some families literally just snack all day and don't actually eat real food so one reason we as women go for the quick meals is because we don't want to have to clean but we have to realize our kitchen's not meant to look like a magazine 24 7. it's okay to get dirty and to have to clean um, it's a work area not an area meant to look like again a magazine so the domestic queen may have pots and pans around the kitchen, steam on the windows, dishes in the sink, flour on her face, but the result is a good home cooked meal and that's the center of the family life. So um, touching on just be bringing femininity to being a homemaker, one thing I definitely suggest you invest in is a house dress or multiple house dresses. Um, so many women, many of us women today don't understand the meaning of the term of a house dress. So a house dress is a cute dress made comfortable enough to work in, usually worn with an apron, especially if you're cooking or cleaning and you don't want to stain the dress. Wear it to function in your career as a domestic queen. It is more or less your uniform or identification mark. When you wear a, fem a feminine domestic looking house dress and apron, there will no doubt be in the minds of your family 
Um, uh, there will be no doubt in the minds of your family about who you are, and that is the being the role of the woman, being the role of the homemaker. And um, this is something that, you know, me personally, I love wearing a dress around the house. I don't have many. And that's something that I'm actually starting to, I haven't purchased a pair of pants, and I will never purchase any more pants. I'm actually continually, when I go out and I shop, I buy skirts and dresses when I can find them, because obviously I personally try to find things that are more modest. So like this dress is something that I wear a lot. I wear it at least two, two to three times a week because I love the freedom of being able to flow around the house and not feel like I'm tight, you know, in some pants. But at the same time, I look very feminine. I look very presentable. Um, it's very easy to throw on a dress and have your whole outfit completed. You know what I'm saying? So having a house dress is definitely key. You look put together when your husband comes home without having to put in much effort and you could actually spend your other effort putting the house together and preparing a wonderful meal. So quickly let's cover the housekeeping character that's necessary. So you may not have thought about it before, but keeping the house clean, preparing meals, managing a household, all of that stuff is a matter of character. The woman who fails in these areas shows a weakness in that character. So one, self-centeredness. We talked about this with selfishness, right? So poor homemaking is usually traced to you being self-centered, where you think too much about your own comfort and pleasure, and you spend your time doing things that make you happy as far as talking on the phone, shopping, going out to lunch, you know, really kind of neglecting your role as being a homemaker because you don't feel like doing it. Um, so that st is stemming from a place of self-centeredness. Um, and you tend to focus on yourself rather than on the things that's going to make your family happy. Number two would be a lack of organization. So if um, Yah, who is our pattern of perfection, sets before us the work of his creations, a masterpiece of organization and systems, from the human body all the way to the planets and the heavens and the stars, he has said, I am an Elohim of order, not confusion. Failure to follow this, ex this example that we have set before us in our everyday life indicates a lack of character. So being having a lack of organization is, is showing a weakness in your character, and we know that we just talked about being an organized woman, right? Um, so, a lack of knowledge. Poor homemaking can be due to a lack of knowledge. This is understandable, especially when you're newly married or a new mom. But when you don't make the effort to learn, it indicates that you have a lack of caring and a lack of character. This can be compared to the man who is not making an adequate enough living, he's not bringing in enough money, but makes no effort to gain any knowledge and try to better his position. If knowledge is not available, then you need to turn to Yah for help because he's going to make it known to you. He's going to show you where the information is or he's going to give it to you. If um, we're taught in the word, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of Yah who gives to all men liberally. We find that in James 1.6. So we should be seeking knowledge and wisdom. Four would be a lack of sense of responsibility. So one of the major reasons that we have poor homemaking in our lives these days is because we have a lack of a sense of responsibility or a failure to assume that the work belongs to us um, and that that role belongs to us. So we assume, well, me and my husband need to split things evenly. He needs to do it too. Or my children need to take care of that. You know, it's, it's, not my, it's not my responsibility. I'm not the only one who lives here. You know, that's one of the number one things that I know that I used to say and that I hear people say. And we have to realize that Yah has ordained women to have a specific role. Homemaking is not the only role. This is just the one we're talking about today. And so to say that that's not your role and to try to put it on other people is showing a lack of responsibility, um, which again is a lack in our character. Five would be laziness. And so this is also a flaw in our character that really kind of helps us to fail at homemaking. Um, and it's a lack of diligence. So we have women who don't care for their family because they're lazy and they just want to lounge around all day. And I've definitely been guilty of this where I literally, there was a week where I did nothing and my house got dirty. And my husband was like, well, when are you going to clean the bathroom? And I was like, when I feel like it. And I was being super lazy. And I could sense, I immediately, like when I kind of realized that, I got myself back into gear and I cleaned the whole house and everything felt amazing again. And it was just me realizing that that was a flaw in my character, of me allowing that laziness to dwell and me just, I literally did nothing for a week but sit on this couch and play games on my iPad and go on Facebook. Like literally. 
and I tried to justify it by saying, well, I feel overwhelmed with YouTube and I really just think I need a day of rest. My husband always knows when I'm full of BS and he'll tell me straight up. And <laughs> it's always a wake up call to tell me, Sinead, stop being lazy, be diligent and get your work done. Um, so summarizing now, coming to a close, don't let the life of being a homemaker become narrow. Don't let it become bondage for you. There's a tendency for us as women who focus our time and attention on homemaking to become very narrow in our interests, to become boring, to become just so focused that we don't think about anything else in life. And that's why, again, I said that it's not the only aspect of our lives. It is definitely a very important one that we need to put emphasis on, but it's not the only one. So um, friends and strangers and even our own husbands may find you boring if you become super obsessed with only homemaking. You need to avoid this by extending your interest beyond just your home and your family. So this means being efficient for one so that you have time to be able to delve into other things, other hobbies, you know, um, education and things like that. Stay aware, keep your eyes open, learn to listen to people and you'll learn a lot from them. Keep up with things going on in the world. This doesn't mean that you watch the news because I personally don't think the news is a very credible source. That's just my opinion. Um, but continue to learn. Read as much as you can. That's something that I do a lot. Yes, I still play my iPad games. I love The Sims. Don't judge me. I love simulation games. And I love um, games that are puzzle games. I love playing games in my downtime. And I love to just relax in my downtime and just cuddle with my husband or just watch him play the Xbox every now and then. But I also make a lot of time to be able to delve into books and reading and learning and growing. And so when I talk to people, I'm able to talk about a, a, a wealth of topics. I even I stay up to date with certain YouTube channels that I consider my news channels. And so when I go visit my family and stuff, I'm able to bring up current events that sometimes they don't even know about. And we're able to have dialogue and discussion. And it's not always me just talking about what I did at home. Because I realize that my life is not just homemaking, there's more to it. And I want to be able to have my own personality, have my own opinions on things, and be able to actually talk and communicate with people and, and be able to have a life outside of just taking care of my home. Um, so, if you're an efficient homemaker, you'll have a lot of time for things that, again, go beyond that role. Um, time to pursue interests, develop talents, and give service. These can enrich your life make you a better person, a better wife, and a better mother. It will broaden your horizons and keep you from being very narrow-minded. Um, and this does not mean narrow-minded in the way of we want to follow the narrow path and be narrow-minded on Yas Torah. That's not what that means. That means you're so focused on homemaking that all you can think about is your schedule and your task and homemaking. There's a difference. Um, so, although family life should always be your first concern, you can be part of the world beyond and influence it. Don't, however, become so involved that you become distracted from the priority of being a homemaker. So in conclusion, what I'm going to tell you today, list your most important responsibilities, check with your family, get prioritized. Um, list, find your strengths in, de, in being a domestic queen and find your weaknesses and work on your weaknesses and um, hone them and strengthen them so that you can become strong in them and remember the proverbs 31 woman which i'll link that video we talked about her below i'll try to remember actually no the playlist for this series is linked below anyway so you'll be able to just click the playlist and find that video um so the next video we'll be doing in this series which won't be till next week we'll be talking about um radiant health which we talked about in the radiant happiness video where we talked about being happy and we talked about how a big part of that is being healthy because if you're not healthy, you're not happy. So the next video, we're going to really kind of give an overview of health when it comes to being a woman and taking care of yourself. With that, Akoti, my sister, I pray that you have a really blessed, awesome day. I'm getting ready to go and prepare for Shabbat now. It's literally 2.06, and so I'm really cutting my time kind of close today. But at the same time, I'm still getting into the practice of not overbooking myself. So I'm going to go ahead and get this video edited and out to you, and uh, I'll see you in the next video. Shalom, shalom.